Welcome to Everything All Right, where the most amazing authors speak about the best books. And this is about a special edition because uh, I'm dialing in, if I can be so old fashioned, from the south of France. And it's very suitable because my guest today is the lovely and uber talented Elizabeth Bucken. And we're speaking about her new novel, Bonjour Sophie, which was out yesterday on Thursday. Bonjour Elisabeth. <laughs> Bonjour, Alain. How wonderful to be here. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just so, have to say, I much enjoyed your last novel, by the way, The Tsarina's Daughter. It was just wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. I always love a little plug-in. <laughs> come back, come back soon. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't bring Bonjour, um, Bonjour Sophie along with me because my, my, my little backpack was very, my packing was very limited. Um, but it's an absolutely beautiful novel. It sort of casts a, a beam of light into the darkness of post-war Britain and this escape of Sophie to Paris to find out um, about the secrets of her past, about her parents, I'm not going to give too much away. It's really a cry for freedom of this whole generation of women. And it's amazing how you bring that across. So how did you have the idea for the story of Bonjour Sophie? Well, it was my own experience, really, because when I first went to university, I think it was 69, something like that, um, I wanted a bank account. And so I went along to the local Barclays Bank and said, could I have a bank account? And they said, of course, my dear, of course. But um, you'll have to get your father or your brother to sign the papers. And I suddenly thought, we have we do still have a long way to go as women and feminism still has to sort of articulate and develop yet again but we have come a long way from that point where i had to get my father to sign the papers in order to get a bank account and today you could as a woman and do head up a big be a ceo, CEO of a big firm you can um work and have your babies it's all very hard and difficult but it is all but those freedoms are there and it's your choice and the choice is what's so interesting to me and what i was interested in writing about in bonjour Sophie. yeah so it was born out of personal experience and i thought just casting back to those days i mean obviously i i wasn't there post-war well i was but i was very small um but I wanted to know how, I wanted to try and find out and write about what it was like to be a girl and then a woman growing up in that era where all these changes still have to happen. Okay. And what was it like then actually at the same time over in France? Was it really so much more liberate? I remember, I think 1948, French women got the right to vote, which was much later than British women, actually, interestingly enough. Yes. But yes. did they already have more liberties? Well, I suspect they did and they didn't. I think what they would probably a lot more subversive in the sense that they dressed how they pleased up to a point um, and they had an intellectual life or were encouraged to have more of an intellectual life than, say, the average British woman. I think there was still the psychology, though, if you look at a wonderful writer, Virginia Nicholson, who, who's written about women all through the decades of the 20th century. One of the things, she wrote a book called Perfect Wives, which was about the women of the 1950s in Britain. And one of the things that had happened was that women had been working during the war, obviously, because the men were away and were running factories virtually and certainly doing a lot of the production and all the, and business and all the rest of it. But then the men had come back and they were told to go back home. But such was the dislocation and the psychic sort of trauma and wounds of the war that a lot of those women just did want to go back into their homes and shut the front door and say, keep out world, we just want to be us and our family. And I think to a certain extent that must have been true of France, which had a different experience. It wasn't bombed and all the rest of it, but, um, well, bits of it were, uh, but uh, had fighting in the streets in Paris, for example, and were under occupation. That was quite different from what we had. Uh, I think there was that, that, inclination and that instinct slightly to retreat back into your world and your family which after all was so important and had been so difficult to maneuver and 
organized during the war particularly if you've been a fighter of some sort and a lot of the women were fighters in yes. the way they were subversion and i think they took that subversion back um to a degree during the late 50s and 60s because it was noticeable i think the french women did enjoy a much more sort of convivial life in many ways than the british woman who was hamstrung by many constraints yes definitely i think french women always had a certain confidence about being yes. being yeah. being a woman and i remember as a student in paris i came back in autumn and one of my friends said to me you have, a, you have to come you have to become parisian again you have to go to the exhibitions and you have to go to the library il faut redevenir parisienne so there was this understanding but you described that magnificently how sophie actually becomes parisienne and equally with her friend harriet when she comes over these scenes you described that with such finesse how did you how did you do your research Well, I wrote, read, obviously, Ellen, um, a lot of things, um, including some journalistic reports of living in, an American journalist in particular, living in Paris during the 1950s. And he got about a lot and was very interested in the small detail. And that I fell upon, uh, as you can imagine, and used some of his detail. I've acknowledged him in the acknowledgements um, and also did a bit of sort of looking at the old records of Paris. I mean, I remember I wrote a book about the French Revolution, three women sort of caught up in the French Revolution in 1789, and that had been inspired, and the same sort of process was taking place writing Bonjour Sophie by taking a book out of um, the London Library bookshelves and opening it, and on the back was one of those fold-out maps of Paris, <laughs> and it, it showed me that Paris was a, th was a city unto itself and in those days it had been surrounded by a wall called the barriere through which all customs uh, all goods were subjected to customs and you had to sort of show show your papers as you went in and out and it showed what a pressure cooker it was and i think that same kind of feeling sort of inspired me to have a look at what paris was emerging out of because during the war it had become you know, turned in on itself. Of course it had been. And now it was beginning, like the phoenix, to rise and build from the ashes, although it was going to take time. It really was going to take time. And the young on the left bank were one of the manifestations of that, where they began to go and debate freely, dress differently from the average woman up in, you know, the more sort of select areas of the city uh the young down in the left bank wanted to wear jeans and have ponytails and um sit in cafes and they were leading the way and uh, this journalist and a lot of the accounts i read did pick up this detail so it was very nice and very um interesting for me to pick that up and put that into the novel those sort of compare and contrast kind yes. of aspects of the life in the city at that point yeah. Definitely, you do you do catch a whiff of young Brigitte Bardot. There's something when you, when when you read those chapters. But you're equally very fair in your description of you know post war Britain, sort of the positive sides of it and the beauty of it and living life in the village. So, what was the biggest challenge for you when you wrote the book? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, obviously, the compare and contrast between Sussex and Paris, the village life, the English life because I've never really lived in an English village. I've always lived sort of more or less in towns, I suppose. Uh, also getting it right, I hope I have, and you've been very kind and said I have, um, about Paris, because it's all very well for the, the British novelists to say, I'm going to write about Paris, but to actually do it, do it convincingly and with spirit and with love does take, you know, quite a lot out of you. So that's, That was very hard. And then, of course, trying to remember or trying to evoke a young girl on that cusp of change, making her own way through life. And, you know, we today are all encouraged and have been encouraged and indeed do take decisions for ourselves. And we're very strong these days about what we think and 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 allowing ourselves to express our opinions. But I, I remember even when I was growing up to have opinions and to think about females as strong and determined and 
with agency was something that wasn't quite okay. I mean, my parents used to say, calm down, my girl, calm down. Um, you, you know, you 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 have to follow, follow the, toe the line, if you like. And I wanted to get that feeling that although you were yearning for change and wanting to do things different, sometimes you were trapped by the people around you, but also by your own self because you didn't have the confidence in those days to say, this is the way I'm going and this is right. So that was, that was quite difficult to yeah. sort of get down on the page, the hesitations and the confusions, if you like. How do you actually, a lot of people always speak about that it's so hard to begin a novel, but it's actually, and I love that you say that, it's actually really hard to end a novel as well and what it takes out of you. So how do you deal with that part of the writing process that kind of, you know, the yeah, morning yeah. And, and replenish yourself? Well, very often you write at the beginning um, and you're feeling away into the story. And actually there's very good advice, which is always get rid of your first chapter. And I tend to sort of cut, cut away at the beginning so that you're, because you're writing about something that interests you and is in, you hope is important and reflective and um, illustrative. But you've also got to remember the techniques you've got as the novelist, which is to get the reader really pinned down to that page as quick as possible. So getting rid of the in, the sort of the ways you find your way into a novel is probably a very good idea. And then at the end, I never know really how. I end it. I only just know there's a voice in my head which says, stop, enough. Now, nah, we've got there. Um, and I, I've learned to rely on that. I think it's your unconscious, which is a very great friend when you're writing. I don't know if you find this, Ellen. Um, but um, when you're stuck about something or you've been wrestling around a page or a problem or a predicament or a scene is to go away and do nothing except something like dreary like the ironing or something or the shopping list and something in your head or your unconscious begins to formulate the answer to the problem and when you get back to the typewriter or the you know whatever you use your if whether you're writing longhand or typing, uh, you'll probably find that um, problem has been recalibrated in your head and you've no idea of the process. The only thing that you have is a gratitude that it's happened. And that's what I find with them. Um, yes, yeah, absolutely. Time, time is quite a magician. Also, yes, just the yes. manuscript shy. Do you have to say all just all sorts of things like rest and chocolate? <laughs> Red wine, rosé. I had rosé for lunch. <laughs> I still, still speak reason. Um, do you still remember sort of starting your first novel? How did you get into writing? Well, as a child, I was alone a lot because my parents were, my father was in the army and he was abroad a lot with my two sisters and my mum. And um, I did the traditional thing and recoursed, took recourse in um reading so I read morning noon and night and a very boring little girl I was my mother said afterwards because I didn't want to play with anybody well, or any nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh it was quite true and um, <laughs> um uh I think then the, the the kernel of ambition was formed and I thought mm, yes I I want to write but it sort of got swept away in university and all that kind of thing and I went and got a job in publishing um, where I worked at Penguin for many years writing the blurbs on the back of the book that sort of thing um, <laughs> and I had, where I had a whole stable of freelancers and four people in in house and we read our way through Penguin books which was a treasure house, Ellen. It was a treasure house. I mean, you know, you could be reading poetry one moment, um, political leaders of the 10th century the next, um, Bernard Shaw on women's socialism, um, you know, or anything. It, it was the widest, widest possible education. And at the same time, you had to um, perfect a craft, which was to get down into a blurb of a hundred, hundred, hundred words, say uh what the book the essence of what the book was about and how it would appeal to a potential reader because if you think about it when you go into a bookshop uh if you don't know what you're if you're just browsing you can look at the front cover and that might attract you and then you'll go like that and you have about 10 seconds 
to get someone's attention and then um, before a deal is sealed whether or not they want the book. So it was a craft. You had to understand how to rip the heart out of a book and how to put it, wrestle it down into those hundred words in a way that was accessible and also informative because Penguin took a lot of trouble over that. He, it liked to think it had standards and, and we in the office really did try to keep those standards, you know, bright and polished. <laughs> but, um, and while I was doing that, I was having babies um, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm not, I haven't got the energy to go and do the writing quite yet. So I had to wait until the babies were mm, five and eight. And by that time I'd moved on to Random House and become a fiction editor, which I was there for a, mm, two or three years. And manuscripts kept coming in and I'd work on them. And I'd think, why aren't I doing this myself? And um, so I sat down and decided on a new routine for myself. And I used to get up very early in the morning and write a page or two pages on the on the predication that two pages became four and four became eight and did publish a couple of novels, one about the French Revolution and another about an SOE agent going into occupied France and falling in love with, with a German officer, which is slightly based on uh, my own family history where my aunt had married a German literally a few months after the war ended they'd known each other before and you can imagine the kind of tensions that produced both sides of the divide and I thought it was very interesting that war is black and white but people's responses to it are never never just that so I published those and um I never forget one of my authors ringing me up at Random House and saying, you're getting more publicity than I am for my books. And I thought, this is not, oh. this is not her. And <laughs> a realisation that if you're writing books, your energy goes that way. And if you're an editor, your energy goes that way. So you end up sort of like this. Um, and you have to take a, you have to make a choice. So I said to my husband, who, um, also worked in publishing I'm, I'm going to give up if you know can we do this and he went very very pale um because it was going to be difficult and he rallied his forces and he said well if we start off Liddy I'll I'll still be thinner than you so <laughs> <laughs> that's the upside we're both very thin pale and interesting <laughs> being artists exactly so what is what would be today be sort of your top tip for any NASA novelist just taking that time out being serious I think know thyself if you're the sort of person who operates better in the morning whittle out a bit of the day however impossible it is with children and jobs and all the rest of it just to give yourself that time to do whatever writing you can and set a really realizable target for god's sake don't try and think i'll do a chapter a day just do 200 words and do that every day and rather like the muscles you develop when you go to the gym you begin to develop your writing muscles and you begin you begin to find that your thought processes begin to work around this exercise that you do every day. Um, know thyself. Do not let the demons of depression about your writing and about its quality get you down. Just do it, get it onto the page, get a first draft down. However ridiculous it is, however badly written, get it down because the first draft is the sort of beginnings of hewing the statue from the marble. And you can sit down and really, really hack and hew and work at it. So you've got something there onto which you will proceed and hack and smooth and develop and rethink and finally come to the end and you'll be surprised. But you do, but you can and do do it, yeah. providing you make that act of will to say, I am going to do this, yeah. but I'm going to do it within the terms of my own psychology, my own physiology, my my circumstances. Don't try and emulate the professional writer necessarily who says I write from nine till two every day and then I go out and have lunch. That's not possible for most of us. Uh, that's another stage on. 
do yeah. you do within the circumstances you're in as the beginner writer? Yes, comparison truly is a thief of joy, actually, especially in it's publishing and writing. Top tip, top tip. <laughs> um, so quick last question before we come to the five faves already. What is next for you, Elizabeth? Well, I've been sort of finding my way around this one. I sort of, um, I wanted to do something to do with AI and things like that. But this is a lesson to anybody who... Um, is thinking about writing, don't try and force something. Because I thought AI was an interesting topic. I found I, I couldn't write about it. I just, in the end, having made several synopses, written several synopses, I just lost the will to write it. And it dried up. And I dreaded sitting down. So I thought, right, I'm abandoning that. So I'm going back to something I, I think possibly will be called Love Times Three. And it's about displacement and how people get together when they're displaced, either in war or um, moving from a different locality or um, their jobs or something like that. And I think it may be three different time eras. I don't know. And I'll weave them together yeah. in a way I'm quite sure of yet because I haven't... But it's a very yeah, it's a very important subject because this place behind is something that is just huge in our lives nowadays in our world and politics. Exactly. So so I love that. So let's do the five faves if I get them together without scripting. What is your favorite book? My favorite book. Oh, that's such a hard one. That sort of um mutates from time to time. <laughs> um, I adored Richard Holmes's Footsteps, which was about starting out his own autobiography to a degree, starting out as a as a poet and ending up as a biographer. And he found himself walking around Paris uh, in the footsteps of Wordsworth and Mary Wollstonecraft. And then he tracked down Shelley through Italy. And he has a gift of making the places the people he wanted to write about, because he did write a magisterial biography of Shelley after that, um, uh, sort of become real and tangible and physical. So I adored that book. And also, I'm very, very fond of Jane Austen's Persuasion, because I think it is a tender book. Uh, it is a book written with real knowledge about what it's like to grow older, and in her case, Illa. And it's a, a real, real understanding of going back to the mistakes you made over your first choices and reassessing them. And for me, that's her standout novel, I must say. And what's the favourite movie? Movie is... Mm, I think possibly it's Shakespeare in Love, uh, because it's so funny, it's so witty, it sort of calls on all the things I love and were brought up with, with Shakespeare. Um, it's so clever and it's visual jokes, it's music, it's score is one that always makes me, you know, lump in throat. And it's e equivocal ending, it, it suggests all the drama and unknowingness of life and of the spirit, if you like. And it's all wrapped up in this wonderful, wonderful sort of script and wonderful actors who make you laugh and make you cry. And they're, they're indelible, those performances. I think. And if you speak about the score, what's your favorite song? Very briefly, we're running out of time. <laughs> what's my favorite film? No, your favorite score or song my or favorite song. aria? Oh, I think it is. Shakespeare in Love or Schindler's, Schindler's Sch List. Yeah, Schindler's oh, List oh, is amazing. Yeah. What's, what's your favourite food? My favourite food is pasta, I think. Okay. Pesto and, you know, um, lots of garlic in the pesto. <laughs> and kissing afterwards. What's the favourite, what's your favourite travel destination? Ah, uh, possibly a trip to the south of France. Uh, and then on to Italy, maybe somewhere in Umbria to go and have a look at frescoes and um, ruined buildings. That is lovely. So thank you so much for joining us today on Everything All Right. This was Elizabeth Bucken, who spoke about her latest novel, Bonjour Sophie, which was out yesterday, Thursday. And uh, please join us next week. And until then, order Elizabeth's book online or better still give it in your independent local bookstore. I'm Ellen Alpstein. And yeah. See you around. Au revoir, Elisabeth. Au oh, revoir, <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Okay, bye.